David Crow, and this is episode 232 of The Infectious Myth. Email me at david.crow at theinfectiousmyth.com, crow with an E. Join the discussion and like us at facebook.com slash theinfectiousmyth. We're on Twitter and Instagram at infectiousmyth. Listen every Tuesday at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time on prn.fm, or subscribe to the podcast. You can listen to any of the last five episodes over the phone by dialing 701-719-0990. You can also call voicemail 862-800-6805. Leave a message or question for the show, your name, and indicate that the question is for the infectious myth. If you dial either of these numbers, long-distance charges may apply. You can make a one-time donation to the expenses of the show via PayPal, using the email david.crow at theinfectiousmyth.com or monthly donations at patreon.com or liberapay.com where we are infectious myth, one word. If you'd like me to speak at a meeting of an organization you're a member of on any topic you think I have an interesting and worthwhile opinion on, I'd be happy to discuss this with you. I appreciate you commenting and suggesting guests. I appreciate your financial support as well. Thanks for listening and for recommending this show to your friends. And now for some feedback. Paul Connett, who I've interviewed on Fluoridation recently twice, wrote, Thank you, David, you are a gem. And, uh, well, I have to confess, not so much of a gem, because the first attempt to post the second Fluoridation show ended up posting the first show again, which may have caused some uh, confusion, which I apologize for. Joan wrote via email, I was very glad to see you do a second show with Paul Conant of the Fluoride Action Network and Bob Dixon of Safe Water Calgary. I consider Dr. Conant one of the most important spokespeople to read truth and reality of the toxicity of fluoride. She also commented that she'd gone to her local food co-op and talked to them about fluoride. Uh, they promote products with fluoride and they say they have to offer choices. I then counter with information <coughs> that they cannot make valid choices I suggested that they ran a short tape about fluoride and toothpaste that customers can watch and then search for more f facts. They didn't want to hear that. Another person who runs a group called the Dental Amalgam Mercury Solutions has approached another local co-op board about the fluoride issue and they didn't listen to him either. Jeff Speck, after I interviewed him on um, Walkable City Rules, a better urban design, uh, tweeted that he was on the at Infectious Myths show and commented, a great podcast. Well, let's get to this week's interview on the very interesting and important subject of forensic evidence in the courts. Frederick Whitehurst acquired his BS in chemistry from East Carolina University in 1974, his PhD in chemistry from Duke University in 1980, and his JD from Georgetown University in 1996. He currently practices law in North Carolina and also works as a forensic consultant throughout the U.S. Dr. Whitehurst is best known for his exposure of flawed forensic science at the Crime Labor Laboratory of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the 1990s and his continued efforts to address issues in forensic science with the National Whistleblowers Center in Washington, D.C., where he is project leader of the Forensic Justice Center. Dr. Whitehurst lectures nationally and internationally concerning issues in forensic science and has authored or co-authored a number of legal and scientific papers concerning flawed logic in forensic science. Welcome to the show, Frederick. Well, thanks for having me. Yes, so it was way back in 1994, I read, that you first blew the whistle on forensic fraud at the FBI crime lab. So what were you finding that concerned you enough that you wanted to go public? Well, actually, it was a long time before that. But um, uh, generally, the laboratory, um, how would you say it? It, in some some ways, bent to political will of people wanting answers that um, the science didn't necessarily support. Mm -hmm. And I worked for a group of people, or I worked with a group of people as a as a um, a support scientist that uh, didn't in in high profile cases didn't often didn't like what I had to say. Um, the science, the data, the interpretations of the data didn't support their hypotheses. Um, 
And so I found, I guess, in the early 1990s that one of the individuals had been altering my reports without my knowledge or authorization. A number of them had been testifying in court to my results, not having a clue what they were talking about, and um, slanting things in in a way that they thought they were helping the prosecutor. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, there's two ways there could be corruption in the lab. I mean, you could try to get guilty people off, or you could try to railroad the innocent. And I'm guessing from what you just said that the crime lab was oriented towards making sure that the prosecution won? Well, a prosecution, and, and you know, that's, that's not, not just a simple thing there, David. The prosecution in the United States um, has a goal of seeing that justice is done. If the prosecutors are being manipulated by crime laboratory personnel, they have no idea about that. They're not trained scientists. They're trained um, attorneys, mm-hmm. and they have no idea about that. So, for instance, if you have a, a, a case where somebody in the lab says, okay, well, I know that guy's guilty, um, <clears throat> he may or may not be guilty, but we decide that with a display of the truth in court. And that's not naive. If we don't do that, um, then you can just give it all up. We, we're not a nation anymore. I mean, we're founded on on a lot of, of principles of um, we're trying to find out what's behind this. Um, the the issue that you've got in the in the justice system is that the practitioners, the folks that are they're not scientists. They they can be bamboozled very mm-hmm. easily by by um, forensic, and I'd say that uh, in quote scientists. So. Um, to say they were trying to to find the innocent guilty, that's, you know, they were just trying to um, see that their agenda was um, followed and the agenda of their bosses. And and that did sometimes, uh, well, uh, uh, one of the obvious cases, one of the obvious situations that can occur with um, a false conviction based on s- somehow corrupted forensic evidence is, is um, a false conviction, but... Uh, are there other issues, like, for example, the the bad guy, the real bad guy goes free? Or, well, I mean, what are some of the issues caused by, you know, misuse of forensic evidence and ends up in a in a conviction that's not sound? Well, one one thing that happens that's that's a big, is huge issue is people lose faith in the justice system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the thing about science is science creates data. And that you can't get away from that data. For many, many years, forensic science in this country tried to hide their data and hide their protocols. That's not the situation now. The FBI openly publishes their protocols. And um, they, they, the, the Drug Enforcement Administration doesn't. They fight like, like bandits, too. So nobody can see what they did and how they did it. But um, most real forensic laboratories in this country now uh, are not um, hesitant to show their protocols, but if you if you act the way those folks that I was raising issues about act, um, eventually this the, the, it's going to come out and it's going to destroy the faith of people in our justice system. And when justice fails, violence prevails. You know, if you, if you don't think you can get justice in a court of law, then you you know, so many people go about finding another way, and that way is 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 too often violence. Um, so, um, bad guys, if you will, the guilty, or the people who have committed the crimes, go free. Um, innocent people get put down, but mostly, um, the American public loses faith in the justice system itself. Mm-hmm. What are specific examples? I mean, you were involved or uh, at least commented on some pretty major cases, some that you listed or that were listed in association with you were the 1983 World Trade Center bombing, the 1993 assassination attempt on Bush by some Q80s, which I didn't even know about, uh, 1989 bombing of an Avianca Airlines airplane, 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, and the O.J. Simpson case. Uh, these these are not minor cases. In the case of Oklahoma City, there was a dispute over <clears throat> whether they were detecting urea nitrite. So 
so I guess two parts to that is like, what's the significance of them misidentifying the explosive? And, you know, what techniques were they using that were unsound? Well, your nitrate issue itself had to do with the World Trade Center bombing. Oh, sorry. The first, okay. the first, <laughs> I didn't ensure. But um, um, one of the issues you've got is, as a scientist, when you get data, you offer all explanations for that data. You offer also alternative explanations for the data, meaning um, if you're conducting analysis on something you've never analyzed before and it's got urea in it and you don't realize, well, you're sweating urea, it comes it's all over your hand. Or they're using it for melting ice on the streets of New York City at that mm -hmm. time. It was winter. Or nitrate ions are, are not uncommon in our environment considering we're an industrialized nation. And so um, not offering alternative explanations for the data would be inappropriate. Um, here, you, you, you know, there's no forensic scientist who's the hero, period. I don't care what they say on television. The heroes are the guys out in the street risking their lives, doing the investigations, knocking on doors, not knowing if the door is going to open or bullets are going to come through. It. Those, those are law enforcement heroes. The forensic scientist um, tests the hypothesis of the people on the street, looks at data, looks at evidence. Well, if, if and um, when I wrote my report concerning urea nitrate of the potentials, and I put in alternative explanations for the data, I was told um, by my immediate supervisor who objected to it, but he passed the message on anyhow. I mean, he was all for me putting um, alternative explanations for data, and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. He said, they, they want you to take the alternative explanations out, Fred. <coughs> well, in other words, what you're trying to do is you're trying to have no question whatsoever when you go before that jury. First of all, you don't trust your prosecutor when you do that. You don't trust the judge when you do that. And you think, um, as one, um, one of the colleagues who was so upset about my alternative explanation said, New York jurors are stupid. You've got to lead them. Well, you know, sir, I don't believe that. I don't believe that, David. I think that's inappropriate, and I think people that believe that, you know, don't have any place in the justice system. You've got to lead them. Lead them where? And are you going to lead them in a direction where um, you really don't get the bad guys, if you will? You really don't get the perpetrators. And another, another problem you have is that um, if you go in one direction with a set of data, the next time you get that same data and you go in another direction, it becomes obvious. You're just, um, you know, you're, you're just, and, and that's what happened at the FBI lab. I mean, the, the folks that were there that were the biggest problem that I was reporting were offering um, explanations that fit the political agenda of, um, of their bosses. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need this guy to be guilty. As I said in, my, in one of my letters, I wrote the inspector general, well, an airplane came out of the sky. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go and look for an Arabic individual, and we're going to make him guilty. But it mm -hmm. may not be that he's really guilty. It may be that this, this fellow had nothing to do with it, and it's a mechanical error. And we're not going to know till the next airplane full of 300 people hits the ground, and somebody has the courage to say, that's mechanical error. Well, I guess we just uh, <clears throat> went through the example of the 737 MAX crashing twice, what seems to be maybe not a mechanical error, but a software error. But, I mean, imagine if the first one had been um, blamed on possible terrorism, how much time could have been lost chasing, you know, the wrong, uh, the, the wrong issue. I was also thinking that if you were investigating a bombing, uh, it's usually a pretty big conspiracy. So you might have the guy who put the bomb in the World Trade Center down to rights, but you presumably are going to want to follow the chain and find out who supplied the materials, knowing that probably knowing that they were going to be used for nefarious purposes. And if you had the wrong bomb materials, then that might lead you down the wrong path path for some of the other people involved. Sure. And, you know, I mean, you're, what you're speaking is common sense. And what I saw going on at the FBI lab when I was there was a lack of common sense. 
You know, think beyond your own promotion. Think beyond your getting that job. As I have this thing has to do with the four R's. If you answer the right question from the right guy to the I mean, yeah, give the right answer, then you get the right job. Okay. Um, and sadly, um, with the pressures that are brought by everyone from the media all the way up to the White House, you know, when our president says, we're going to go get this guy, then anybody that doesn't join his team is fired. <laughs> okay. And that's, and I'm not speaking about the president administration. I'm talking about any administration at all that jumps in to a criminal investigation rather than waits until the evidence leads where it's supposed to, that jumps into a criminal investigation and says, this is what you better find out. Um, so, <clears throat> um, you mentioned the, the media. <clears throat> Do you think that shows like CSI and things like that that show, to me, show forensic evidence as a black and white thing? Somebody has a magic test, they run the test, they find always the right answer. Um, has, has this sort of corrupted or, or, or given? the average person a false sense of security when it comes to forensic evidence that's used in real court cases? Well, I compare CSI to Avatar, the movie, or to any, any fantasy. You know, people love good fantasy. It's entertaining. And CSI, I look at that or um, whatever, and I say, well, I hope people entertain. Frankly, I don't want to look at it because, you know, I'm sitting there, <laughs> I'm sitting there saying, yeah, a gas chromatograph does not do that. You know, that instrument right there is not capable of that or, or whatever, you know. But it is good fantasy, you know, I mean. But, I mean, the difference between Avatar is, you know, Avatar, you, you get a warm feeling, you want to save the environment. Um, <laughs> but in the, in the case of CSI, I mean, when you read in the newspaper afterwards that, you know, somebody was convicted, and the only real evidence they had was, say, hair analysis, which I'd like to talk to in a minute. Talk to you about yeah. in a minute. Um, the people are going to say, "Oh, isn't that amazing? That real life is just like CSI." <laughs> well, you know, there are some people that I worked for all the way up to the top that demanded that we believe Avatar too. Okay. I don't mean that literally, but. You, you know, I, I, that's why I went to law school, because I, I used to shake my head in disbelief and say, are, are, are you kidding me? Can no one else see? You don't need a Ph.D. in chemistry to see that this is foolishness. But the justice system is one of the biggest marks um, on the street. You know, call it science, call it we did it in a lab, we did it with a mass spectrometer or whatever, and they just sort of roll over and accept it. And I know I practiced law for the last 16 years. I've kind of slowed down a bit. But um, I walk into court, and I understand why they have to accept what's before them. Defendants don't have a national defense forensic laboratory. Mm -hmm. The government has a forensic laboratory. The prosecution and those, those laboratories are working for the state. And it doesn't make them bad. There's just, in our adversarial system, no way to overcome or to show the errors that may come out of that environment. And so... Yeah, so, I, see, I see what you mean. I mean, it's, it's like there's a built-in bias <clears throat> for an FBI crime lab to... I mean, the FBI is, is uh, tasked with getting out and getting the bad guys. And it's very... And, you know, that's, that's a good thing, but it's easy to confuse that with, um, you know, we've got to hand the public uh, a villain in this case. You know, it's in yeah. loose sight of whether it's the right guy or not, or, or whether it was just a tragic accident, as you said, and not that at all. One thing you said about the crime lab is that there were people working in there when you were, um, you know, whistleblowing about it who were not even trained scientists. Yes, that's right. Our chief chemist of the time I was there hadn't acquired a degree in chemistry. Um, and most of the people in the unit that I was raising issues about, I mean, they had degrees in political science, sociology. There wasn't one biologist, but when he got out of school, he couldn't get a job, so he worked as a concrete estimator. Um, 
history majors, whatever. The people that were trotting on the justice system, um, they just knew the answer, and they weren't going to put up with the scientific method. But I saw, I've seen um, academic credentials of people. Every once in a while, they slip through the cracks. You know, in this country, our privacy of what we made in college uh, trumps due process. You're not allowed to see somebody's grades to find out whether they had the aptitude or intelligence or interest when they were doing their scientific uh, education. Mm -hmm. But people that are in those crime laboratories, you're not allowed to know, and that, and therefore the, lab, the FBI laboratory was corrupted in that way. Um, you know, as an expert witness, when I give you my CV, I, got, I have all of my grades, all of my transcripts, every bit of it attached. Right. If you have a problem with the fact that when I was in law school I got a D and and Mr. Diamond's or Professor Diamond's industrial, I mean, uh, uh, corporate law class, well, then raise it. Mm -hmm. You should understand, if I'm talking about um, complex chemical analysis, that may not be relevant, but raise it anyhow. If it, you know, right. you need the, the right to, well, you can't do that in this country. But, I mean, at so, least you have a degree. I mean, what does, what does a guy in a crime lab who's got a political science degree do if, is he called as an expert witness, or would he just put forward a no, result? No, no, he would be called as an expert witness. In fact, one of the things I raised issue about was, you know, a guy with a, with a uh, say, a Bachelor of Arts degree in English literature is rewriting my reports without my knowledge or authorization. And not just correcting your English. And then, <laughs> and, um, and then testifying to the results in court with have, having no idea about the nuances of what he was looking at. How does the judge accept an English major as an expert in a chemical I'll, matter? I'll, I'll tell you how he does. Okay, I'm interested. The scientist, quote-unquote, gets on the stand and he says, I have a Bachelor of Science degree, and nobody asks him in what. And it's a trick. It's a trick, and they got away with it. I have a Bachelor of Science degree, it could be in a lot of things, sociology or English or whatever. But, but that's but, a Bachelor of Arts degree. No, you can have a Bachelor of Science degree in English. You can have a Bachelor of Science degree in okay. a lot of different areas. Okay. Um, so nobody asked. And there were, there's so many tricks I could see in plain view. Uh, these people are flim-flam artists. They're actually going in there and talking about things that they haven't even been qualified in our own laboratory for. They're talking about things they have no idea what an atom or a molecule is. They have no idea about the laws of physics or any of that. Well, yet, why did the defense let them get away with it? I mean, why, does, why wouldn't the defense object to, you know, could the defense not discover that this degree was in political science, not anything close to chemistry? Well, they weren't at the time. They weren't. And I think there are in, in, there are in, in any case unaddressable issues. And science was what was referred to as an unaddressable issue. You know, we like to do 2020 hindsight sort of thing, but I'm a criminal defense attorney. And I walk into court in the morning, and there's 700 people in a court, and there's 360 minutes of court time to handle 700 cases. You get 30 seconds to handle your case. It takes me almost 30 seconds to say Fourier transform infrared spectrophotometry, <laughs> and you need to look at the interferogram, and I want the raw data because I don't know what appetization, but you see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. it, there, I'm, I am among a few aberrations why would you degree to get a phd in chemistry and then become an fbi agent oh come on <laughs> you know go make a living go you know well there's a few of us that didn't we you know we went into forensic science the uh, the fellow that essentially replaced me is an absolute at the fbi um and i'm saying that that spent most of the years i had somebody replace me that i i didn't have a lot of of faith in, but down the line a couple of years, that fellow was an extremely good scientist, mm -hmm. way, way up the ladder for me. When I see his work product, I tell folks, you know, you, you can take this to the bank. Mm -hmm. um, 
I may find issues with it, but not they are not moral, ethical issues. They're issues, you know, about, um, well, okay, I, I might look at that just a little different or something like that. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's now moved on into upper management, and I hope that he's got a handle on what's going there. But um, uh, I've seen him now in cases, oh, a dozen times, and he's, he's good. He's righteous. Um, one of the issues that was mentioned uh, related to the time at which you were a whistleblower was hair analysis. So what kinds of cases is hair analysis important in, and, and what's the problem uh, with it, or some of the problems with it? Well, hair analysis shows up in murder cases and assault cases and uh, rape cases, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. where, um, there's a principle that they try to give a name to, the, the principle of low card or whatever. If I and you grapple, what's on me will end up on you, and what's on you will end up on me, and we'll mm -hmm. exchange, whatever. And so there's hair there. Right. And I knew there's been a, a huge public revelation back in 2015 about issues with forensic hair analysis. I knew those people, and they were hardworking, honest, good people. And I never saw them, uh, when I was next to them, I never saw them as hot dog, um, you know, grab the microphone and I'm the guy. There was one man among them who I found out in 1989 and given false and misleading testimony in a hearing involving an accused federal judge. And when I found that information out, the judge is now a senior U.S. congressman, but I gave that information to the inspector general, who then it, it's you know became a, a big um, open scandal. Well, I spent years collecting that one individual's work product, with the understanding that if he lied in court 27 times in one hearing, or gave false and misleading testimony, let's say it that way, um, according to one of his colleagues, then he might have done it in other cases. And so I collected his his uh, work product, and I've mm -hmm. as much as I could get under Freedom Information Act. In 2009, a man was freed after 28 years in prison for a rape murder he did not commit, which the mm -hmm. U.S. government agreed. And then two other fellows, and he was one of the victims of this guy, and two other <laughs> fellows held up their hands. And was this Michael Malone? The agent was Michael Malone. Mm -hmm. the guy yeah, not the freed, guy freed, yes. The guy that was freed was Donald Eugene Gage. And anyhow, um, you know, uh, I'll do an aside here. In forensic science, was this mistake, uh, the first thing that all forensic science managers do is say it's a rogue thing, okay? And we stopped him from doing it, and we'll take him out. Nobody asked the question who was hurt. Nobody. And, you know, if you testify a 1,000 times or 500 times, how many of those people were hurt? Mm -hmm. But if you trained every hair examiner in the United States in every state and expected them to follow what you did, that's hundreds of thousands of potential um, victims, okay? Well, when the other two guys held up their hands, these other two victims, they didn't turn out to be that fellow's victims. They turned out to be victims of the guy's boss and one of his colleagues. And then, as one of the victims who's come forth said, the Whitehurst was the pebble that started the avalanche, and then it just tumbled. And the FBI and the Department of Justice and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and Innocence Project partnered to try and figure out who got hurt. Just by this one guy or by hair analysis in general? By hair analysis in general. Mm -hmm. So do you believe that hair analysis can be done right, or is, or is it based on bad assumptions? I think, first of all, sir, I, I'm a chemist. I'm not a hair analyst. I okay. wouldn't do that because I don't really have a lot of faith in subjective analyses. But I think what they did starting in about 2000, the early 2000s, was they brought DNA online. So if you think you've got an, uh, a match with hair, then you have to do a DNA analysis to see uh, if there's a patch. Okay. So that's a pretty good check. I mean, the hair analysis is then just a screening algorithm, right? Like, you you think this is hair from the the suspect, 
and you do DNA and it's a suspect's DNA, well, th then I guess we could be pretty sure about that. No. Nope. <laughs> Look, if you find a lab that's going to cheat, then you have to ask where those two hairs come from. Yes. I was involved in a in a investigation of fingerprint fraud up in New York at one time. Yeah. And folks were just lifting fingerprints from one place and saying they got them from another place. And uh, and when that came out, um, you know, it's a real mess. And so, you know, I, I had proposed a potential solution for it, but the FBI didn't want me out on the street proposing it because it would be an admission that there might be a problem there. So you say, um, can we trust it? Uh, as far as you can trust um, your fellow man not to run into you at the stoplight, okay, at the intersection. Right, so in other words, if I manage to get some hair from the suspect completely unrelated to the crime and then present that in court with DNA, proving that this hair came from the suspect, well, that's a true statement. But when I say that it, it was found on the scene of the crime, that's the fraud. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, it's and pretty... if, if, you, if you look at the literature about forensic fraud, it will blow up at you. Just Google forensic fraud, and the, and the Internet will blow up at you. I think one of the foremost investigators, a fellow named Brent Turvey, T-U-R-V-E-Y, but um, it all of a sudden becomes frightening. It overcomes the CSI effect. People have cheated in crime labs all over the United States and in federal laboratories. Wasn't there a woman recently who spent her entire career basically making up drug results? Well, yes, uh, she was up in Massachusetts and another right. one of her colleagues also. 30,000 cases in jeopardy. 30,000 cases. Oh, well, yes, and they, they dismiss some thousands of cases because, uh, you know, at that point, she went to prison, I think, for three years. That's a small amount of time for that, that much, you know, crime, but that's what they decided to do with her. So if it comes out of a laboratory, unless the laboratory is completely transparent and works for the people rather for than getting this twisted idea that they're working for the police, okay, and works for the people unless that's, and you can show that, then um, then you need to say, okay, um, we didn't solve this crime until the forensics got involved and now we know who did it. Well, come on. <laughs> okay. Yes. Come on. Uh, don't, if if you find somebody holding himself out to be a hero in forensic science, then you need to really, really look at him. Look, you know, just look in all his pockets, because there are no heroes in forensic science. They are handed evidence, and they're asked to analyze it. And the guy that has the aha moment um, needs to be... There needs to be concern about it. Well, they or often her. they often say that in a, in a company, if if there's some fraud happening or company funds are being stolen, you want to look at the guy who uh, comes early and stays late and is the most diligent employee <laughs> because he's trying to cover his tracks. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wanted to go back to the whistleblowing because uh, my understanding of the timeline is that uh, the FBI reacted like many institutions. Uh, basically shoot the messenger and that yes. there was like a 10-year court case and that ended up with not only a, a monetary settlement to you but um, maybe more uh, importantly reforms of the FBI some outside supervision things like that but then a few years after that maybe another 10 years it was revealed that some of the reforms hadn't happened so, yes. so, so can you comment, like, what kinds of reforms were, were promised and then what actually uh, didn't happen in the end? I think most of the things, first of all, they built a whole new laboratory and they needed that as a laboratory building. Um, they instituted um, uh, documentation of protocols, quality assurance, quality control programs. They're, those things are extremely expensive and and crime.
crime labs that don't have quality control programs are are they, they shouldn't be allowed in a court of law. Um, they they have pushed even recently that the protocols will be up on the internet and that um, the validation studies and a study that's a validation study is one which shows your you you you're, you're, you've been asked a question. You went about giving an answer, but what you did to get the answer, will they give the right answer? Mm-hmm. And um, validation studies, which are extremely expensive and extremely time-consuming. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, frankly, in this country, put more effort into putting flowers in the middle of the interstate than we do into forensic crime laboratories. They're, mm-hmm. all, they're always, always working overworked and... Um, and I'm not talking about personal pay. Most of the people that are forensic scientists are not doing it um, so that they can walk in the same companies with the Donald Trumps of the world. <laughs> okay? They're, they take a job and they do it because for the same reason that mostly, you know, they want to help people. They want to, they want to do something worthwhile. But there were one of the, one of the biggest issue I have with when you find out that you've been doing it wrong, you owe it to the citizens that you have harmed mm-hmm. to make them whole. That go back and try to find and and with the hair analysis, there were so many people hurt that the gross national budget could not have handled. Uh, so you get people in prison who've been sitting there, and there's quite a few that have come out of the hair debacle. Okay, but they had to fight them. They, you know they're. They're, they're in a cage. They can't even get books. They can't even get anybody to pay any attention to them. They're like animals in a cave. And um, they can't get through the door. And those people have to overcome what the FBI put them or a forensic laboratory put them into. So as, opposed to, as opposed to the, the state saying, you know, we screwed up, so we're going to go through these cases. And, you know, if... And we're either going to give a new trial or we're going to uh, acquit. Yes. Basically, that's sort of a, a proactive approach as opposed to a very passive uh, mm-hmm. approach where you basically just resist and, the, and then occasionally somebody breaks through your barrier of resistance. Yes, and I'd say that the major failure of forensic crime laboratory management is cowardice. Stand up. Be a man, be a woman, be a be an adult, admit there was an error, say these are the cases that there could have been an error in, they need to be reviewed, sorry. Now, in Massachusetts what happened was <laughs> that young lady messed up so many cases that they just had to let people go. Right. There's just right. not enough money, just not enough money, and they let bad guys go and good guys go and all kinds of people go, thousands, <sighs> because there's just not enough money to fix that. You know, in in August 2013, the FBI management recognized that the first cases, 20, 30 cases they looked at in hair analysis were all bad. So they unilaterally shut down that hair analysis um, program. I mean, mm-hmm. and in August 2014, somebody, it wasn't me because I didn't know what was going on. I got the hint that it, somebody blew the whistle on it in the Washington Post. Um, put it out there, and the FBI was ordered by Department of Justice to restart that program and do it right. But, David, unless the media is watching them, it's not going to happen. It's, it's just not going to happen. The FBI doesn't have that courage. These, these forensic laboratories do not have that courage. They just don't. Uh, it, it's sometimes it just seems um, overwhelming. I mean, I mean, the the justice system is very profitable for a lot of people. There's yeah. private prisons. There's private companies supplying the prisons. There is all the prison guards. It generates a lot of revenue. So the thought that there's you know, maybe tens of thousands of people in jail who shouldn't be there is going to be a financial hit. But there's also kind of a psychological thing of, of what they I've heard referred to many times that the sort of the desire for finality is greater than the desire for accuracy of convictions, which I, I think goes to an ego thing, right? Like if if you're a, a crime-busting prosecutor, um, 
and you have to admit that you put 20 people in jail, 200 people in jail, based on you know corrupt uh, forensic evidence, you're not going to look so good. So you're going to resist any attempt to do that. And there's no accountability whatsoever. There's like no a, if a if a prosecutor is caught deliberately you know, uh, hiding evidence or using corrupt evidence. I mean, how often does a prosecutor go to jail for that? Well, a prosecutor doesn't go to jail for that. <laughs> and a forensic scientist can know um, there's just no accountability. You can do anything you want to. You can say anything you want. And even if you get caught in one trial, they'll put you into more of them. If a good criminal defense attorney cross-examines you, or a prosecutor finds out that you don't, you're not credible, you just go home, keep doing what you were doing. The crime lab bosses poo-poo, oh, well, they don't know science, or whatever. And you keep doing it. There's no accountability. I would propose that, for instance, in the hair analysis case with, uh, with the, the, that one fellow that started all of this, um, they take his house, they take his retirement, they take what he's got, and they take and they put that into making whole the people that he hurt. And somebody knowing that with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English literature, okay, and there's, I'm glad for those folks. I love to read, okay? However, they don't belong in a laboratory. They will not go into a crime laboratory knowing if you screw it up, you're going to be held personally liable. But you've got this... Um, Oh, well, they work for the government, therefore they can do anything they want to and get away with it, and nobody's ever going to do anything to them. It, there's just too many of, of these cases. There was a, a pediatric forensic pathologist in Canada named Charles Smith. I don't know if you've heard about him. But they basically decided that, I mean, this was slightly different, but all the medical evidence he gave in court was unsafe. Um, and there was a similar guy in England, I can't remember his name, who was highly respected, giving evidence in court that turned out to be um, corrupted. And in, in many cases, it was similar evidence. It was bite marks. It was um, hair. It was lots of the same thing that a forensic lab might um, deal with. Yes. I, I was interested in a paper you sent me on marijuana. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, uh, I studied biology in university. And uh, I remember one of my professors was called into be an expert witness up in Canada by the RCMP because the question was, is this marijuana um, cannabis sativa or is, are there other species which are not covered by the law? Um, and you mentioned that issue in the papers. But um, y you, y you know, it seemed to me it was pretty obvious um, marijuana has a d distinct smell. So if I catch somebody with some marijuana in his pocket, and, and we can talk about the drug war, the war on drugs afterwards, just accept that uh, possessing marijuana is a crime. You know, isn't it pretty simple? You smell it, and it smells like marijuana, and you're done? <laughs> but you well, did you know, find a lot more complexity. If you go into a crime lab and use a mass spectrometer, you have to calibrate the mass spectrometer. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm wearing, I'm personally wearing hearing aids in order to decide how they were going to work for me. Somebody had to calibrate my ears. Um, I just had cataract surgery. I'm getting old, by the way, David, but I just had cataract surgery. <laughs> but somebody checks my eyes by calibrating my eyes. Why does no one do olfactory sensing calibration? Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people present to medical practitioners every year with issues with taste and smell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So do you know that what the fellow is smelling, marijuana is, the odor from marijuana is composed of well over 100 different chemical compounds. Right. There's over 500 chemical compounds known to be in cannabis sativa. And so the fellow that goes in there and says, I smell marijuana, what is he detecting? What's he detecting with his nose? And then it gets more complicated. Could I find that in any other plant species? Mm. And okay. I think based on your work, one of the things I have not done is to smell plants that were specifically selected because their smells was similar to marijuana. I have never done that. And I'm sure most uh, drug uh, policemen or whoever haven't done it either. 
Well, somebody said the problem's so terrible, um, the world's coming to an end, therefore the standard we're going to set is extremely low. <laughs> and nobody okay. questions, nobody questions, because we're trying to save the world from the devil's lettuce. Now, I don't smoke it. I've never smoked it. I wish people didn't have to take it. Um, but whatever, for whatever reason, as a pure scientist, and also as a guy who used to, as an FBI agent, yank the stuff out of the fields in Northern California and destroy marijuana crops that people had growing in my neighborhood. I lived out in the in the in the hills. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, the issue you have is is uh, even if you're looking at the stuff, you have to ask: Am I my visual and my olfactory sensing? Is it consistent only with marijuana mm-hmm. or is it could it be one of the other 256,000 plus known species of seed bearing plants mm-hmm. it would be very easy to do that work very easy US Department of Agriculture or any national department of agriculture could go could take the the protocol that's used and compare it to and they've already got the data, but nobody does because <clears throat> it's not a problem. And if you walk into court, and I've done it as an expert witness, and start talking about this logic, um, you either put the jury to sleep or the judge sort of poo-poos you or, you know, you're an idiot or whatever. I, I've been patted on the head figuratively and literally so many times. But if you think logically about it, um, that's what's written there. <clears throat> Well, you did a very interesting uh, analysis where you de- deliberately looked for seeds because often, I mean, yeah. I guess one of the issues with marijuana is it's, it's like if you're confronted with a living, you know, or a freshly cut marijuana plant, you know, that's you have a lot more information than if you have a bag of dried and crushed leaves. But within those leaves, there will almost always be seeds. And you deliberately looked for seeds that could be confused with marijuana, and you, you found some that seem to be very similar. Well, we only looked at 1,000, and the 256,000 known plus, and it varies from who the author is. Some of them think there's up to 500,000 mm-hmm. known um, seed-bearing plants. You get 256,000, there's only 40,000, when we were looking, there's only 40,000 known seed seeds themselves in herbaria, which are collections of uh, Mm -hmm. plants that are known. I mean, uh, we may have 256,000 species of plants, but we don't have that many seeds in collections. Mm -hmm. And so saying that this is unique, and I've seen that, no one has done that, David. No one has, in what, what, what you hear is a trick, and it just screams at you when you hear, once you know you're being tricked. We have we have there are no known plants that give the same results as well what's known if i close my eyes i don't know anything if i just <laughs> yes. look around my neighborhood i'm looking around a neighborhood in say the coastal plain in north carolina but when you get cannabis sativa you get marijuana from any place you've no idea where it came from and did this just come from Mexico or Peru or or Thailand or whatever? Okay, what plants are there? And it, there's no answer for that because nobody's bothered. Because in a rush to judgment, we're terrified of the devil's lettuce, and we just don't start asking questions. Well, well that's a whole other issue. Like I, you know, personally, yeah. particularly with marijuana. I, I think let's just legalize it and be done with it because the damage it does is dramatically less than alcohol and tobacco. <clears throat> but I, I was just really interested in more from the forensic perspective, not of from course. whether we should be throwing these kids with a dime bag in, in jail. Um, but from the opposite perspective, could I say that, okay, there are other seeds that can be confused with marijuana, um, but, you know, what's the chance that a guy walking around with a package of dried herbs in his pocket has one of those other seeds that looks remarkably like marijuana seeds? And that is exactly the question. And in the United States, we have Rule 702, which is Rule of Evidence 702, and, and 
and you, I mean, and Dalbert versus Merrill Dow and his progeny, um, there these law statute and case law that says we need to know the error rate. And the fundamental questions are: Can your protocol be tested? Has it been tested? And what's the error rate? And the protocols we're using, like you're saying, well, I'm going to look at the seeds. Of course you can. Has it been tested? Um, no. And what's the error rate? You ask, what is the possibility? And what you're doing is not, I mean, you're just asking the question, and you're not giving an answer. And in our courts of law, we require an answer to the question, what's the error rate? What is the possibility that? And you can say, I mean, there's this science called, come on, Fred, okay? That's the, that's the <laughs> science of, I'm going to make a fool of you if you ask a scientific question. Um, I had a boss at the FBI tell me he was tired of my techno-legal babble. And when I was listening to him, I was thinking, my God, we're forensic scientists. It is techno-legal babble. <laughs> right. You know? And- and your job is to make, is, is if you get into court, your job is to make it clear. Like, I, I mean, I guess I have a background in biology, but when I read your paper, you also talked about the hairs on marijuana stems, and you described two very different kinds of, of hairs. Yes. Uh, and I presume that if you, if you found the seed, and it looked like marijuana seeds, and then you had a piece of stem, and the hairs looked like marijuana, that your probability of it actually being marijuana has gone up dramatically with those two pieces of evidence as opposed to one. You just made an assumption that's not legal. Because the judge is going to say to you, that's your hypothesis, sir. Have you tested that hypothesis? And this is frustrating for people to have to obey the law, for people to have to argue against what the law is, Mm -hmm. literally, and what the science and the extent of the science. I mean, come on, you know? And it's that sort of, and that's, I found that at the Bureau. You don't want to have a, I mean, working in a bombing case, and the guy's, oh, he must be guilty, he's Arab. You know, he's Arabic somebody, and he he must be guilty. Uh, What? Wait a minute. (laughs) Well, let me suggest, let me suggest uh, uh, the steps that could be taken and tell me if, if I'm off base. So right. mm-hmm. we find all the plants that have seeds that could conceivably, using a fairly loose definition, be confused with marijuana. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we look at the stems of all of those plants, <clears throat> and uh, we see if they have hairs that are even close to marijuana. And, and now we have a much reduced number of plants that have both seeds and hairs that look like marijuana. They might be a handful. <clears throat> and then you've also described that there's a test for phenols, which is by itself not diagnostic. But of these, maybe we've got half a dozen species that, that have hairs and seeds similar. How many of them also have phenols? Um, we may be down to zero at this point. Maybe there's still one or two. But if you, if you put together a list of tests that c- combined would eliminate errors, <clears throat> you could be very sure, and it wouldn't be that burdens- burdensome to do maybe three tests instead of look at the microscope once. Of course. So what you've given is, I mean, what you're saying is, uh, for you and I, you have a degree in biology, what you're saying is common sense, and, and I'm, I'm cool with that. So why don't they just do it? Yeah, well, that's, because, a, that's a good question. Why don't they do it? Well, <laughs> because there's, as a friend of mine at the DEA laboratory system said, Fred, unless we've got a problem, we don't have the funds to go about solving it. It's got to be a problem for us. And well, until, the, until the courts ask the question, how do you really know this? And what is the error rate of your you know, of your opinion, what is the possibility you're wrong, then until the courts ask that, uh, then, you know, well, nobody's going to take that on. These are not very good bureaucrats, because a good bureaucrat's main aim is to build a bigger empire. So every time there's a problem, a, a good bureaucrat, in the sense of a good empire builder, would say, 
you know, we have a dramatic problem. We're going to raise it with the political folks and say that if we don't uh, validate these protocols, we're going to have all these cases thrown out, and we're going to have all these bad guys back on the street dealing drugs and killing people. So we need a billion dollars to do all of these tests. That's, that's what um, empire-building bureaucrats should do. They, and in lots of other domains, that's what they do do. Right? Like the, the so it hasn't been a problem. <laughs> I see, because they're still getting convictions, therefore we don't need the money to do the validation tests. It hasn't been a problem. And, and honestly, when I, you know, when I express these, these kinds of issues and someone, one of my fellow colleagues says, you know, attorneys and the bar, they say, well, you know, Fred, come on now, you know, we know you, we know that's not marijuana, is it, Fred? And I say, that's not the question. The question is, is it marijuana? Not, it's not marijuana. I'm saying, is it marijuana? Or, you know, right now in my state, we've legalized industrial hemp. And so there's an issue of um, the fact that you cannot use those tests that you're talking about to, to say whether I have something legal in my possession or not. Right, because hemp and marijuana are essentially the same plant. It's just that hemp doesn't have the uh, doesn't have the THC. Um, we've we've talked for quite a long time, and we're coming towards the end of our time. So I'd just like to give you an opportunity to uh, get anything out that you hadn't had the opportunity to say during this discussion. No, I can't imagine. Uh, you're right. We've talked. To we talked for about an hour now. Yes. It's been a good discussion, though, David. Well, it's fascinating, and I think I, 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 I've been listening to some podcasts on false, false convictions, and I, I think maybe the winds are turning that the average person is now maybe more interested in people who are being thrown in jail unfairly, who are actually innocent, rather than seeing the sanitized kind of crime investigations on shows like CSI, shows of the past. So I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that things might turn around a bit. Well, and, and for every good solution, there's another problem. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> okay, that's a voice of realism. So, Frederick, thank you very much for joining me today. I really appreciate uh, this okay. amazing discussion about forensic evidence. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to episode 232 of The Infectious Myth. If you have a comment, a question, or a suggestion for a future guest, please email me at david.crow at theinfectiousmyth.com. Like us at facebook.com slash theinfectiousmyth. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at infectiousmyth. Commit to monthly donations of any amount to infectiousmyth, one word, on patreon.com or liberapay.com. Until next week, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>